Hi, welcome to this latest online vodcast lesson providing important principles and analytical practice in the field of rhetorical criticism. This is the third installment in a three-part series on Neo-Aristotelian criticism. One of the earliest frameworks of rhetorical criticism, uh, it's a simple one, but perhaps the most useful for those just beginning rhetorical criticism for the first time. What we're going to do is complete our discussion of the steps of Neo-Aristotelian criticism according to Sonia Foss. We're discussing the second step, uh, applying the classical canons of rhetoric uh, to a rhetorical text, focusing especially on the canon of invention, and in this lesson, emphasizing the artistic proofs of ethos and pathos as defined by Aristotle. We're then going to move on to the third step of analysis, which is uh, assessing the impact and effects of a rhetorical text on an audience. But first, let's have a brief moment of review. In the first lesson of the series, we talked about the first step of Neo-Aristotelian criticism, which is reconstructing the context. We talked about how you want to use background research as well as careful analysis of what you find in that research to reconstruct what we know about the rhetoric, the occasion of the rhetoric, uh, and the audience that the rhetoric is being directed to. And we talked about some different uh, perspectives for how we might understand rhetorical context. In the second installment in the series, we introduced the idea of applying the classical canons of rhetoric, uh, invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. And we focus particularly on uh, the canon of invention, which is focusing on how the substantive arguments and primary rhetorical content and appeals are constructed in a message. And we emphasized the proof of logos, what Aristotle refers to as logical argument patterns, the way in which we understand how reasoning and uh, the validity of evidence moving to claims can be assessed in a piece of argument. We talked about how Aristotle discusses the example as a basis for inductive logic in argumentative reasoning, as well as how the enthymeme or a rhetorical syllogism can be used to deploy deductive logic in an argument. Okay, so what we're going to discuss in this lesson is going to emphasize the proofs of ethos and pathos. Before we get to those, let's remind ourselves about the text that we're working with. We're looking at the Obama for America 2012 uh, campaign advertisement entitled Firms, which attacks Mitt Romney and establishes President Obama as a preferable alternative. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, forever waves of gray. Or purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with bright. The second of our, uh, Aristotle's uh, artistic proofs is ethos, and this proof focuses on the speaker, and specifically the character and credibility of the speaker. It's important to point out that what we're not talking about with ethos is the pre-existing uh, status or reputation or identity of the speaker. Uh, the fact that President Obama is the President of the United States, for instance, is something that uh, existentially helps him in his credibility, but that's not what ethos is. Ethos is how that credibility is constructed in the message. So for instance, the very first part of this advertisement where we see imagery of uh, President Obama walking on the White House grounds with the voice saying, I'm Barack Obama and I approve this message, that would be an example of ethos. It's not just the fact that he's President of the United States, but he's pointed out to you in the message, see where I am, see who I am, I'm President of the United States and I approve this message so I'm taking accountability for it. That's ethos because it's constructed as an appeal in the message. Ethos, according to Aristotle, is comprised of three primary components. Good sense, I am persuaded because I trust you, and I trust you because you're logical, you're intelligent, uh, you're knowledgeable, you have experience or relevant authority, you know what you're talking about. The second element of ethos is good moral character. I'm persuaded by you because I trust you, and I trust you because you share important values with me. Uh, constructing uh, values of right and wrong, uh, good and bad, and so forth. And values are good moral values if the audience agrees that they're good moral values. The final piece of ethos is goodwill. I'm persuaded by you because I trust you, and I trust you because you have the best interests of the audience at heart. 
uh, one is more credible, has a better character, if they're able to convince the audience that I want you to agree with me, not just because that's going to benefit me, but because it's going to benefit you, the audience. So these are the three primary elements of ethos. Good sense, I know what I'm talking about. Good moral character, I've got the right kinds of values. And goodwill, I have your best interests at heart when I present this message to you. Okay, see I told you ethos is a lot simpler than logos. Very basic sorts of principles. So what we need to do is see in this message, how is it that the Obama campaign constructs President Obama's ethos? Now note, because of the nature of this message, it's going to be a little bit different than some traditional messages. They're going to not just present President Obama's character explicitly, but because, as we've already seen, this ad focuses on character attacks on Mitt Romney, what we might want to assume then is, by implication, uh, President Obama's ethos or character is being established as a point of implicit contradistinction. Right? In other words, be, Mitt Romney has these kinds of qualities that provide bad sense, bad moral character, bad will, if you will. And so implicitly, by contrast, President Obama would have the opposite sorts of ethos. So what sort of good sense ethos appeals did you find in the firm's ad? Here's what I was able to find. The ad demonstrates a command of factual evidence on Romney's past. Uh, the examples that we talked about earlier about how he, uh, through his business, eliminated jobs and uh, sheltered his tax money come uh, from uh, cited, uh, documented uh, sources of information on each of those text boxes. So presumably this isn't information the campaign's just making up. This is information that's been confirmed by other sources that are out there. And so not only does this provide sound evidence for the argument, but it also also demonstrates that Obama and his campaign have a good sense of what's going on factually uh, in the background of this candidate. The fact that we've got these uh, uh, source citations verify not just that Obama knows some things about Romney's past, but that these are independent facts. So we can trust that uh, Obama is utilizing good sense because he's relying on evidence sources and research to make his claims. He's just not making stuff up. The second element of ethos, of course, is good moral character. So take a look at the ad and ask yourself, uh, what examples of good moral character ethos appeals are present in the ad? Here's what I found. F throughout the ad, uh, there's an implicit embrace of the values of work and the values of patriotism. Uh, and they're done by ironic counterexample. Uh, by really emphasizing uh, not just that Romney eliminated jobs, but also uh, communicating uh, the problem of that emotionally through pathos, which we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, there's a real sense that work is something that's very important and something that Romney doesn't value. By contrast, uh, it's something implicitly that Obama values because he's attacking Romney for not having that value. Uh, as well with uh, patriotism. Well, you have a real interesting sense of irony going on in the ad. Um, while there's information being presented that shows that Romney has been sheltering his money from U.S. taxes overseas, Romney can be heard across the entire ad uh, singing America the Beautiful. So Romney has taken American jobs away and made it possible for these jobs to be made available in other countries. Romney has also prevented his money uh, from funding the American government by hiding it away in other countries. So Romney is putting himself above his country, which is a sort of anti-patriotism, which is conveying the message that Obama really values country and patriotism over personal gain. So we get a sense that Obama has the good moral values of valuing good, hard American work and valuing uh, putting our country first by process of elimination because Romney doesn't value those things and Obama finds them uh, a legitimate source of attack. The final area of ethos is goodwill. So one final pass in terms of ethos on the ad. Uh, what examples do you find that suggest that Obama is trying to convey a sense of goodwill for his audience? Okay, here's what I was able to find. Uh, very similar to the way that the moral character argument is being constructed, the ad really presents an implicit empathy for the plight of unemployed Americans. This is very connected uh, to the pathos appeals that we're getting ready to talk about. 
uh, the notion is that Romney just does not have empathy uh, for the needs of the American economy and the American worker. And by contrast, then, Obama presumably has it because he's attacking Romney on these grounds. As you can tell from these latter two elements of ethos, uh, the notion of appeal uh, to the speaker's credibility in terms of values can be very closely connected uh, to appeals to audiences' emotions and feelings. But we want to make sure that we keep those two aspects of the analysis distinct. That way, we don't confuse how we feel about something emotionally with how we value it in terms of our ethics and principles. That being said, let's talk about that third proof of Aristotle's artistic proofs. Pathos, or the emotions or sensations of the audience. This one's really easy to get a handle on. Aristotle talks about the importance of targeting the emotional and the visceral reactions of the audience. How is it that appeals in the ad make us feel? Uh, and again, not just psychologically, but perhaps even physically. How do appeals in the ad, be they uh, really evocative language or images or music or sound, how do they tap into our temperament, the way that we feel about things? How do these things in the ad appeal to our senses, uh, our sense of vision, our sense of hearing, um, our sense of whatever? Uh, how does the ad tap into our personal motivations? And again, we're not talking about ethical values in this case. Here we're talking about psychological drives, those things uh, that uh, compel us on that more base psychological level. Okay, so one last pass at the uh, Obama ad. Think about what goes on in firms. Think about uh, the language use. Think about the imagery. Think about the use of music and sound. What examples of pathos can you find in the ad? Here's what I found. We see those images of empty workplaces, the empty factory, the empty boardroom, uh, and those with the language that talks about how jobs have been removed here and sent overseas uh, may well evoke in the audience, especially a target audience of working class Americans, feelings of sadness or frustration or despair. Now, then we see images of exotic locations uh, like uh, the Cayman Islands and Switzerland. And when that's paired up with this information about how, Obama, uh, how Romney is sheltering his tax money, this may tap into feelings of resentment. Uh, while and think about the way that these two are structured together the American worker is being eliminated and we have all of these empty factories and boardrooms and this feels really awful and now look at all of these exotic locations that Romney's able to take advantage of you know, the sandy beaches of the Cayman Islands and traveling overseas in historic Switzerland well that kinda stinks and so we might resent Romney for how he's able to benefit from his wealth and he benefits by screwing over the rest of us. And then all of that is overlaid uh, by Romney's uh, off-key singing of America the Beautiful. Now, at the moment that Romney engaged in that activity, it was kind of a sweet moment where he connected with uh, the folks that attended his rally uh, with a kind of a cheesy uh, but still really heartfelt uh, outreach to patriotism. But when you take that song and you combine it with this imagery and these other uh, points that are being made about what Romney's been doing, we have a real sense of irony. He's singing about America the Beautiful while he's screwing over Americans. And that might lead to a sense of anger or a sense of indignation on the, fa on the uh, part of the audience. So this is one of the things that you want to do when you're examining pathos. You don't just want to identify elements of the ad and say, that's going to provoke an emotional reaction in the audience. You want to think about what kind of reaction do you suppose it's, um, it's going to evoke? Are there particular senses that are being triggered? Are there particular psychological reactions that might be uh, predictable from this kind of appeal and that the Obama campaign might be trying to trigger on purpose? That's the whole idea behind pathos. All right. Now, as we wrap up discussing invention, uh, it's important to note that the other classical canons then would follow suit in a more full-blown neo-Aristotelian analysis. We touched on this in a couple of points, but what you might do then is engage in a further examination of arrangement, of the organizational structure of the advertisement to see how the pieces are edited and structured together sequentially and what difference might that make for the argument or the audience's psychological reactions. 
we can certainly focus on the element of style. We've talked, for instance, in uh, this analysis with regard to ethos and pathos about how the use of visual imagery and the use of music and their juxtaposition um, present the message in such a way that evoke reactions. Similarly, we can talk about things uh, stylistically such as tropes, uh, figurative representations such as metaphors, for instance, or the use of figures, uh, the artistic use of phrasing of points. Uh, in other uh, rhetorical criticism lessons in this vodcast series, we'll talk about some of these stylistic elements. We could also talk about delivery, the presentation of the text. Uh, again, in a traditional public address, this would be the vocals and the nonverbal presentation of the speaker. In the case of something like an advertisement, we might look at such things as the practices of editing, the use of special effects, and so forth, that take the various rhetorical elements put into the ad and present it through technology uh, in a way that's potentially compelling. But that's the second step of neo-Aristotelian analysis. After we've reconstructed the context, we want to apply the classical canons uh, to the message to see how it operates, with a special attention uh, to the canon of invention and the proofs of logos, ethos, and pathos. The final step of neo-Aristotelian criticism is the evaluation step of uh, the critical enterprise. And in this case, we're assessing the impacts on the audience. According to Foss, what we want to do is think about what potential effects this kind of message could have. And it depends on a variety of different variables. Uh, the writer's intentions, uh, what we know about the context, uh, what we were able to find through our analysis of the artifact. One of the things that we may want to be concerned about is what might be any immediately visible response. Some of this you might be able to discover in background research. After this ad came out or after this speech was made, what do we know about how people responded to it? Um, and then more importantly, if we don't have access to that information, we could still make some educated guesses based on what we know about the audience and based on what we were able to discover in our analysis, what sort of responses might we predict from the target audience based on the way that these uh, appeals are put together. We also might be concerned not just in those kinds of responses that might happen immediately after viewing the ad or listening to the speech, but we might also be interested in responses that could emerge at a later time. Uh, could there be impacts uh, in the form of implications or consequences of this ad or of a speech or whatever it is we're analyzing um, later on? If we embrace the message of this ad, if we take its uh, persuasive points to heart, if we were to internalize them. Um, now that that's affected our belief in attitude structure in some way, how might that potentially influence the way that we perceive other messages or other appeals uh, or um, other encounters with uh, political or social others um, in, in subsequent times? So. So when we're thinking about the impacts of a message on an audience, we want to think a little bit more broadly about the effects of rhetoric. And there's at least two ways that we can think about rhetorical effects. The one that we might most naturally or normally consider when thinking about rhetoric are the instrumental effects. Uh, if Aristotle defined rhetoric as the ability in a particular case to identify the available means of persuasion, the instrumental effects we might consider are those persuasive effects. How uh, might a given audience in a given context be persuaded? And again, a, a simple way to define persuasion would be an uncoerced attitude change in a desired direction uh, based on communication. We're not talking about coercion. We're not talking about unconscious manipulation. But how might my beliefs or values or emotional valences be shifted one way or another based on the message that I've received? And uh, did that uh, shift in my psychological state move in the direction that the persuader wanted it to move? That would be an instance of instrumental persuasion. So with regard to uh, Obama ad uh, attacking Mitt Romney, what you might want to think about is, well, given the way that these logos, ethos, and pathos uh, appeals are constructed, and given what we know about the target audience, what's the likelihood that this target audience of working middle class families might be persuaded by this message? Um, how might they uh, decide to favor President Obama's candidacy over uh, Governor Romney's candidacy at this particular point in time? Okay, so given the interest in instrumental persuasion, let's go back to that Obama ad and think about the potential uh, instrumental evaluation of it. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of persuasion here? 
As I look back on the analysis of firms that we've conducted and I think about the target audience, here's the kind of conclusions that I draw. Um, I want to think about the extent to which this is a fitting response to the situation and whether it's likely to be persuasive. And so a couple of points that I draw as conclusions are that the ad does a really effective job of addressing target audiences to exploit Romney's weak weakness. If you watch the first uh, video in this series uh, that analyzed this ad in terms of the rhetorical situation, you'll remember that Obama's target audiences were working middle class families that uh, perhaps uh, had lost their jobs or their jobs were vulnerable and were struggling under the weak economy. And uh, a particular uh, element of the situation that Obama wanted to take advantage of was the perception that Romney was a rich elite who was out of touch with middle class Americans. Obama wanted to blunt uh, the assumption that because Romney has a strong business background that he would be actually more qualified and effective in fixing the economy. And so what this ad does is uses the arguments about Romney's background to attack that sense that he knows what's best for business and instead establish that he is, in fact, a rich elite who's out for himself and out of touch with Americans. And so by doing so, the ad does a pretty good job of motivating odors on the key issue that they care about. We know from our contextual analysis of the situation that the economy and jobs was the most important issue for these voters. And so this ad really literally hits the voters where they live. Beyond the instrumental rhetorical effects of persuasion, uh, there's another layer of rhetorical effects that can be really important. And that's what uh, some critics have referred to as the constitutive effects of rhetoric. What we're talking about here are the kinds of impacts, as uh, Foss mentioned, that may emerge at a later time and those that might have more enduring impact. And that really gets to the heart of the construction of meaning and reality for a community beyond the immediate context. What we mean by this is that if I'm compellingly persuaded by a particular message, or more importantly, a series of messages that makes the same kinds of points, then those sorts of appeals might really internalize in the way that I perceive uh, certain elements of reality, such as the relationship between presidents and the economy, or uh, the way that I define certain ideas, or the way that I understand certain values. And so one particular way this happens is described uh, by Jody Cohen as the process of rhetorical hailing. Uh, this comes from uh, Louis Althusser's uh, discussion of interpolation, or basically imposing identities through address. The notion here is that uh, a form of rhetoric can engage in the audience uh, understanding themselves as a particular kind of person. If I'm persuaded by a message, uh, I may also be affected by the way that that message suggested for me who I am. Uh, what kind of person should I be? Uh, what are the kinds of things that I should believe in or value? Uh, what kinds of things affect me emotionally? Related to this is what Cohen refers to as the impacts of constitutive rhetoric on what we know. In other words, what is real to us? Uh, perceptual knowing, uh, how it is that I make sense of the environment around me and how I make sense of messages as I receive them. Uh, there's conceptual knowing, uh, how it is that I understand uh, a larger idea, an idea like the economy, for instance, or an idea like uh, the United States of America. And then, of course, there's ideological knowing. Ideology is essentially a set or a matrix of interrelated uh, beliefs and feelings and priorities uh, and values and those things that drive the way that I understand what is common sense um, in uh, the society and the culture that I live in. And uh, an ideology is something that is embraced and promoted uh, by the entire community, or at least dominant factions in the community that essentially define what is normal reality for the rest of us. So what we're talking about with constitutive effects is essentially constructing a sense of what is real, at least what we perceive as real uh, as audience members um, to the extent that we're persuaded by the rhetoric that we hear. So consider a constitutive evaluation of firms. If we are persuaded by the message and similar messages that President Obama has provided for us, uh, what sort of implications might this have uh, for the construction of our political reality? Well, 
what we want to think about in this case is how the text reconstructs our perceptions of reality. And so one thing that happens as a result of this ad and other campaign messages from the Obama campaign like it is the redefinition of Romney's character. Uh, besides just I'm persuaded that uh, Romney's an inferior choice uh, to Obama with regard to my presidential vote, um, understanding who Romney is as a person is being redefined for the American voting audience by the ad and messages like it. So Romney is no longer uh, the entrepreneurial pro-business economic expert that's going to save us and save the economy. Instead, he's being reconstructed as um, a, a vulture capitalist, uh, a business person who's really in it for themselves and for corporate profit at the expense of ordinary people. Who he is as a person is being reconstructed for the American voting audience. And similarly, another thing that's being reinforced ideologically as well as conceptually in this ad and messages like it in presidential campaigns is a, a reinforcement of the popular expectation that a president is in a position to fix the economy or a single person like a president is in a position to hurt the economy. Uh, and this is a widespread perception that lots of people have, and it's perpetuated every time we have a presidential election campaign. Uh, the notion that a president is going to be able to put people back to work and give people jobs. Uh, a president is going to be able to uh, spur economic growth and uh, lower inflation and affect gas prices and things like that. Now there are certain things that a president can do that might have an effect on those kinds of economic factors, but something like the economy, like jobs, like economic growth, is a really complex uh, enterprise with lots of interrelated variables. It's a rather difficult conclusion to logically draw that any president could single-handedly fix the economy or single-handedly hurt the economy. But this message reinforces uh, a message that lots of other campaign ads and campaign speeches do. So this is another constitutive implication of the ad. It reinforces for us, to the extent that we are persuaded by it and believe it, that someone like Mitt Romney could hurt the economy even worse. And someone like Barack Obama is better positioned to save the economy when it might actually be the case that no matter who's president, uh, whether the economy rises or falls is going to depend on a whole host of other variables, of which a president's only going to be one. Okay, so this is, in a sense, the kinds of things that we're going to be interested in when we engage in neo-Aristotelian criticism. So you take away points for the lesson. Remember that neo-Aristotelian criticism focuses on situational persuasion strategies. And so what we've been focusing on in this lesson is what sort of strategies do we really need to focus on? What we want to do when we do this kind of criticism is to reconstruct the context. How do we understand the rhetorical situation that led to this message in the first place? Then what we want to do is apply the rhetorical canons, invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. And here we especially focused on invention and those three artistic proofs from Aristotle. Logos, the use of logical argument and reasoning patterns. Ethos, the construction of the speaker's character and credibility. And pathos, appeals to the emotions and the senses and the psychological drives of the audience. And then once we've done that analysis and interpretation, we move to our evaluation and we assess the potential impacts of the text, both in terms of its potential for instrumental persuasion, as well as for potential larger constitutive impacts on the way that we perceive reality. Thanks for watching and I'll see you at the next lesson.